How are you today? Well, we're glad to be together. We love celebrating together here. If you're joining us online, wherever you're at, so glad that you could join us as we go into week two of a series we started last week called It's Time. It's Time. And we talked about uh, getting off of the place where we're at and moving forward. If sometimes we need a, you know, a a little beat beat to get us moving forward. And so today we're going to be talking about the importance of freedom. It happens to be a great weekend because today is Martin Luther King Jr. week, you know, weekend. That's tomorrow's the day, but his birthday was yesterday and this is the weekend and and you know, Martin Luther King Jr. really his life was about uh, a big part of it was about freedom and I wanted to take a moment and over the next few minutes and look at that. In fact, we want to, I want to compare and look at some lessons we can learn and actually see some similarities in the life of Old Testament Joseph, OTJ, not to be confused with OBJ, Odell Beckham Jr., who's awesome. Uh, that, we're talking about OTJ, Old Testament Joseph, with MLK, right? And, and look at the the, the lives that, that they both impacted, and you might be surprised, there's actually quite a few similarities. You know, this is a significant weekend, and we do like to take a moment and, and, and look at that. Uh, I have a number of African-American friends, and when I talk to them, you know, this, especially in like the times of the last few years where there's some unrest, and they talk about this need for continued progress. Certainly there's been progress with the Emancipation Proclamation, with the eradication of the Jim Crow laws, or at least the laws are, you know, a lot of the laws have been changed, thankfully. And, and then we've seen with the Civil Rights Movement a lot of shifting and changing in our culture. And there's really been work done since that point with diversity, awareness, and a number of things that, that uh, our country's trying to address. But the truth is there's more work to be done. I think that is some of the resonation that's happening with uh, some of the, the challenges we've seen, as I said, over the last uh, few years. And so what we see is, is these, we're going to look at Old Testament Joseph, and that was uh, many, many years ago, centuries ago, and really an ocean difference and a culture difference, but they, they had a lot of similarities that we can, we can, we can grow from. And, uh, and so let's look at that, okay? The first of all, as we advance forward, is uh, their lives were defined by dreams, by dreams. They knew the power of dreams. Uh, they both were dreamers. If you were to talk to any uh, Bible student and say, uh, you know, what? tell me about uh, somebody, a character in the Bible who is known for uh, his dreams, they right off the gate, they're probably going to say Joseph. They're going to say because Joseph was known for his his dreaming from an early age. He was a dreamer, and he earned the contempt of his brothers because his in, his dreams included them. It in, it included uh, he didn't know it all the time, but it, it nationally, I mean, he it, he was just as it unfolded in his life. Here's how they derided him. They would this is his brothers. They said, here comes. Another one, here comes that master dreamer. And so that's not a, that wasn't a term of endearment. It was a term of derision, like, hey. And they were so offended at his dreams and his dreaming, they threw him in a well. They were thinking of killing him. And they decided better to humiliate him and get rid of him at the same time. And so they sold him into slavery, got a little money out of the deal, and thought, hey, we're done with this guy. But because... 
of his ability, Joseph's ability to dream, and his uncanny ability to interpret dreams, it ends up catapulting him, this dreaming and interpretation of dreams, into national and really international influence. Well, MLK was this young black pastor from the deep south in the 20th century. Now, he only had a brief 39 years, but dreams defined his life as well. In fact, you could really go anywhere in the world and stand up, and if you were to say the words, I have a dream, all over the world in people's minds, they're going to think of Martin Luther King Jr. That's, who this, that's who's going to, and they're going to think of those, those, uh, those enduring words that he said at the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, because dreams have power. You know, dreams, God wants all of us to have dreams. That is a thing that defines our lives when we have a crystal clear dream that we're moving towards. When I was in Arizona as a younger man, I came to Christ and God gave me a dream. I had my own dream, which was, you know, to do certain things in business and all. And then God gave me a dream for ministry. So I thought that meant to plant a church in Arizona. Then he gave me a a very, I mean, literally a dream that brought me out here to Regent University and, uh, and to Virginia, Virginia Beach specifically. And that dream led me to meeting my wife, Sharon. And uh, that dream led me to uh, having, you know, a family. But God also gave me a dream about a church that would be racially inclusive, that would be uh, generationally diverse. And, and as we started this church, Sharon and I, 27 years ago, that was our dream. Now it took a while, and it's still in progress. You know, I have a dream, and then God's still making that dream uh, come to be. But dreams will define us. And so it's important to have quality dreams. It's important to have God-given dreams. Well, evidently dreams lead to persecution. That seems to be the tendency. You start having a passion, you have a dream, a calling, and the price of membership for having a God-given dream is that you get persecuted. Stephen really had this prophetic, I mean, certainly uh, Old Testament Joseph, MLK, were prophetic in their own rights. Stephen was one of the prophetic voices in the New Testament, and he says, was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? And so persecution Uh, seems to come with the turf of being a dreamer, and persecution has all shapes and sizes. Now, with Joseph, he he ended up being incarcerated, just just like Martin Luther King did. And so he was incarcerated for two years. What was his crime? Well, when he was sold into slavery, uh, this, the, uh, his, the bo- his boss or his master's mistress or wife would kept making advances towards him. All he did was said no. She got so spurned, so angry, she falsely accused him of rape. He got thrown into jail for that, in something he didn't do. Well, Martin Luther King Jr., he was in jail 30 different times. What was his crimes? Going into a restaurant where there's a big sign, no Negroes served here, and then asking for a meal. His crime was refusing to uh, obey a white police officer who told him he couldn't uh, have a, lead a protest even though it was legal, constitutionally, civically, to lead a, a uh, you know, a, a, a protest, a, a peaceful protest, such as the Montgomery bus boycott that is pretty well known. He was arrested for just going a couple miles an hour over the 25 mile an hour speed limit. And so he was uh, just arrested. There was bigoted intimidation. What's interesting with both OTJ and MLK is when they were incarcerated, when they were in jail, they both, if you read between the lines, you can see that they both were held in high regard by the other people in the jail at the time. They influenced people for good. Why? Because they were good. 
You see, you can persecute a good person, and no matter what happens, no matter what circumstance they land in, they're still going to affect other people for good because of that. Number three, nonviolence in the face of hostility. Now, when you have opportunities to resort for violence and you choose not to, that, that's a demonstration of your character and your courage. Now, with Joseph, he was, as I said, thrown into a well. They were going to leave him for dead. They sold him into slavery. He never got to see his, his father again and his brother. And, you know, I mean, just... And he's shoveling manure or whatever for some slave master somewhere. That ends up, because of circumstances there, he ends up in prison and jail. Now, he had a lot of reasons to be inspired to try to hurt them because the tables turned. And he ended up having an opportunity to hurt those who had victimized him. But he chose not to go that way. Dr. King had a divine assignment to challenge the justice system, which was basically justice for some, justice, no justice for others, or little, which means no justice at all. And so he's standing up for that. He's standing up for social reforms. And God gives him this, div this divine assignment to do peaceful protesting. He's a, he says, hey, we can speak out, we can march, we can demonstrate, we can strike, we can boycott, we can do sit-ins, we can carry signs, we can try to change laws. And what, was, what came at them, what came at MLK was billy clubs to the head, fire hoses, bricks. His home was firebombed. Other people's homes were firebombed. That's where, like I said, character and courage are tested. Because these were legal Marches, they were permitted, and all they got was brutality from police. So what, they would, what Martin Luther King would do is, is he would gather his, his, uh, the people that were going to protest that day, and he would do three things, was his habit. He would read Bible passages about nonviolence. Then he would pray, and then he would say something like this. This is one of the things he did say. Quite often, in the power of God, we will overcome someday. Our cause is right. Our purpose honors God. Our means of overcoming all this injustice must honor God as well. See, both of them understood that the means does not justify the ends. That the underpinning nonviolent response, civil disobedience, is really saying, it's a, it's a Christian perspective. It's saying, I believe God will settle the score ultimately. So it's merging our faith. And we're not, it's not all on us. God's at work in all of this. Great verse says, May the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you. As the old saying goes, from evildoers come evil deeds, so my hand will not touch you. And so the Lord avenges. Being involved, recognizing, hey, God's, at work in this system. It's not just me. You see, there was people in Martin Luther King's day that said, we need to buy guns. We need to buy knives and, and shed the blood of the oppressor. There was people that said, we need to start looting stores and local businesses. And he would steadfastly say, that is not the way to overturn this injustice within our, within our society. There is a temptation all of us feel when we've be, been wronged. If you've ever been wronged, which I'm pretty sure everybody here has, and if you've ever been wronged deeply, you know the desire inside that wants to retaliate, especially if you were given that opportunity. But we have a mission about honoring God with our lives and recognizing God is going to mete out justice. Not that we don't do anything, but... The ends does not justify, I mean, the means does not justify the ends. We want to go about this in a God-honoring way. You know, interestingly, both of these men ended up in the presence of kings. You know, the, there's a proverb that says, if you are uniquely gifted in your work, you will rise and be promoted. You won't be held back. 
you'll stand before king. And that's really what happened to both of them. Joseph uh, had this incredible credibility. Even, you know, he, he, here he is, even in prison, he stays, his character stays intact. He ends up getting, as I said, launched into a national, in fact, what happens is he goes before Pharaoh, interprets his dream, he ends up second in command over the largest nation, the largest empire of the day. And he's there for 80 years, impacting the whole world. He goes from a jail cell to a king's palace. Now, that's a God thing. There's just no doubt about it. God raised him up. Well, Martin Luther King Jr. also had a God thing where God took this humble, young, black pastor from the South and millions of people start following him, both black and white. And so he ends up in the presence of kings and, and presidents and senators and congressmen. They're wondering, what, what's going on here? You know, what's, what, what's this guy got? And so he was wined and he was dined in the Oval Office in Washington, D.C. But they would then pat him on the head and say, settle down, Martin. Settle down. Stop stirring up things. I mean, if you think about it, it's not so bad. Look at how much progress we've made. It's okay if you guys ride in the back of the bus. It's okay if the kids are, go to segregated schools and uh, they're broken down schools, rat-infested schools where they really don't learn anything anyways. Just tell your people to wait. One time in a Birmingham cell, it's a little too long to put on the screen, so I thought I'd just read it. He, uh, he writes this. He had just been, again, unjustly arrested and imprisoned. And here's what he says. He says, we have waited for more than 340 years for our constitutional and God-given rights. Perhaps it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging dark of segregation say, wait. But when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will, and drowned your sisters and brothers at whim. When you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, and even kill your black brothers and sisters, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park, that has just been advertised on television, and see tears welling up in her eyes when she is told that Fun Town is closed to colored children, and see ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form in her little mental sky, and see her beginning to distort her personality by developing an unconscious bitterness towards white people. When you have to concoct an answer for a five-year-old son who is asking, Daddy, why do white people treat colored people so mean? When you take a cross-country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no motel will accept you, when you are humiliated day in and day out by nagging signs reading white and colored, when your first name begins with Negro, your middle name begins boy, however old you are, and your last name begins, uh, becomes John, and your wife and mother are never given the respective title Mrs., when you are harried by day and haunted by night by the fact that you are a Negro living constantly at tiptoe stance, never quite knowing what to expect next, and are plagued with the inner fears and outer resentments, when you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men are no longer willing to be plunged into the abyss of despair. I hope, sirs, you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. That's what he says from the jail there in Birmingham. You know, it's worth noting that even though he was wined and dined in the Oval Office, he never joined the inner circle. He leveraged relationships to advance the cause that God had put in his life. But God used him in that way. 
spent time in the presence of kings, had dreams, persecution, nonviolence in the face of hostility. Both men chose reconciliation over retaliation. You know, it's, it is interesting how Joseph, he had all of this power. Uh, he got it because part of his dream included knowing there was going to be this horrendous famine. And the famine affected not just Egypt, but Canaan and all these areas where he, Canaan where he was from. And so his brothers and his, his family were starving as well. So they come to get food, to get grain at Egypt, where he's at, where he's in charge. They come up to the palace, in fact, and they don't even recognize him because I guess they think he's either dead or, you know, serving in some degenerated way. But he recognizes them. And he has the opportunity because he's now second in power. He can do anything he wants. And part of his mind, he probably thought, hey, I'd, you know, this is payback time. Woo, baby. It's my turn. Let's flog these guys. Let's torture them. Let's publicly shame them or humiliate them. Let's maybe just kill them. He had all of that opportunity. I mean, if you were given that opportunity, wouldn't those at least come into your mind? You just have this, I won't do it, but I'm going to entertain it for a little bit. I mean, that's probably what's going on in his mind. But instead, he does something remarkable. He provides for them. He gives them provisions and then ultimately lets them off the hook. They say, now Joseph will pay, these are the brothers who had sold him into slavery, will pay us back for all the evil we did to him. But he says, don't be afraid of me. Am I God to judge and punish you? As far as I am concerned, God turned into good what you meant for evil. He doesn't, he doesn't say what you did was wrong, wasn't evil. He goes, but God's involved in it. For he brought me to this high position I have today so that I could save the lives of many people. No, don't be afraid. Indeed, I myself will take care of you and your families. Now, that's remarkable at every level. Saying, I'm going to relieve you of that guilt. In fact, the story goes on where one by one he embraces them, weeps with them, and forgives them, reconciles with them. It's an incredible story. If you wanted to read, it's in the first book of the Bible, Genesis, chapters 45 through 50. Certainly worth the read. But what I know about uh, human nature, and I think you would agree with this, is that hurt people tend to what? Hurt people, right? That's just what we do. That's, that's our, you know, I've been hurt, and so we hurt others. And this is Martin Luther King Jr. weekend, and we're talking about being free from that, taking a different response. Certainly there's, the world has one way, and they might only know one way. But God has a way. In fact, Jesus came along and he said, so if the Son sets you free, he's talking about himself, he says, then you will be really free. Really free. He's saying you get to choose your response. You get to choose love over hatred, forgiveness over grudge bearing, grace over getting revenge, reconciliation over retaliation. You see, Joseph knew the insides of a prison cell. He knew what it felt like to be there. He spent two years in a dungeon. I think he knew. He goes, I don't want, I think he said to himself, I don't want one more day spent in a prison. And he knows, he knew that that pathway of retaliation and bitterness, unforgiveness, just keeps you in another prison. It just keeps you locked up. And so he chose for the spirit of liberty, which comes through forgiving, through forgiveness. That was Joseph. 3,800 years later, Martin Luther King makes the same choice. 30 imprisonments, false accusations, lies about him, 50 death threats, stabbed almost in the heart with a letter opener. His home was fire burned. Hatred due to his color and the cause that he had given himself to. Unbelievable levels of hatred and intimidation and injustice. And here's what, here's what he wrote at that moment.
He said, I've decided to stick to love. I know that love is ultimately the answer to mankind's problems. So I'm going to talk about it wherever I go. I've seen too much hate. I've seen too much hate on the faces of sheriffs. I've seen hate on the faces of too many Klansmen, too many white citizens, counselors in the South. Every time I see it, I know it does something to their faces and to their personalities. I say to myself that hate is too great a burden to bear. So I've decided to love. If you are seeking the highest good, I think you'll find it through love. What a great statement. He also said this, darkness can never drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So we get to choose. We choose, do I want to stay in that prison? Or do I want to set myself free through forgiveness? Now, I've been around and talked to enough of you in the vineyard to know some of you know about forgiveness. You know how it's important to God. You hear messages from time to time about the power of forgiveness and the freedom that comes from it, and yet you choose to hang on to that. You hold on to that. You rotisserize that pain and that hurt over and over. You just turn it over in your mind, and it's in, you know, digital color and surround sound and, Turn it over in your heart, and you keep yourself stuck in that prison. Jesus modeled this so beautifully when he's on the ground and executioners are driving nails through his hands, driving nails through his feet and crown of thorns into his head, and then lifts them up on the cross. How does Jesus respond? Father, forgive these people. He says, for they do not know what they're doing. Now, at one level, they do know what they're doing, right? They're sneering at him, and they're they're happy about it, actually. They're mocking him while he's in all that pain. But Jesus says, no, there's something else going on here. They're not free. He had just talked about what it takes to be really free. And when we have these hurts and betrayals and wrongs in our lives, and we hold on to them, we get stuck. That is a terrible way to live. My prayer for you this week has been that you would step into a place where you would receive God's forgiveness for yourself. And you would also then be able to give out forgiveness. Now, it is a process is what I've discovered. You might even be thinking, you know what, that would be great. I wish I could, but I can't. That's why we offer our freedom groups. A number of you have taken it. We did it as an all church thing just not that long ago because we think it's Important that everybody walks free. And so I'm going to invite you and just actually starting next week, we're going to have open registration for you to join a small group. If you are still struggling with this area of finding freedom, of forgiving, then I encourage you to sign up for our freedom, one of our freedom groups. It's incredible. God will do something through that 12 weeks that you might have been in counseling for years, 12 years, and you haven't found it. We have seen it time and time and time again, including myself. I have my own pain that I have been processing. And as I went through the third time, believe it or not, because I've I been one of the teachers, uh, God just opened something up. I got such a deep level of healing. And I'm, thank, and I'm happy to re- tell you about that. I'm still in process like we all are. But if you've been deeply wounded, you, you, those things, they don't just go away like that. I wish they did. But together, as we study God's word and pray for one another and open up our lives, God will do something amazing. The Bible says, if someone does wrong to you, forgive that person because the Lord forgave you. That's a decision you get to make. And we have a process to help you find that. Then lastly, is fully prepared to meet God at death. You know, it's interesting. Both of these guys were fully prepared to meet God at death. In Genesis 50, we see Joseph's death, and it's actually every person's dream. If you, if you, if, I think for everybody here, if we were to get to choose how we would die, it would be like Joseph. Joseph's surrounded by family and friends. 
He's at peace with God. He's at peace with himself. He's 110 years old. He's lived a life well. He's honored God with his life. And he's fully prepared for heaven. And he blesses his family. He blesses his friends. And then he breathes his last. And he dies. Well, Dr. King, unlike Joseph, is, his death is every person's nightmare. He dies prematurely, unexpectedly, violently, publicly, on the balcony of a cheap hotel. It's bloody. There's a bullet to his neck and through his head. It's motivated by bigotry and hate, the very things that he had fought against. And the only ray of light on that evening in Memphis is the fact that he was a Christ follower. And the Bible says, for we for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, we also believe that God will bring with Jesus those who died while believing in him. That's the promise we have as Christ followers. It's, we believe there's something greater. And God is calling us in this life for a dream, but he's got the ultimate dream awaiting for us. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Dr. King was prepared to die. He had, as a younger man, he had confessed his sins. And he had gotten right with God. He received God's grace, God's redemption. And that is why he was able to fulfill the calling that God had given him to. Because it began with his own life. And it's really pretty remarkable because he only lived 39 years. And the impact he led, he had because of that. Because of him, him leading a life of, of character and courage, integrity. And he was concerned, in case you're not sure, he was concerned about spiritual freedoms for people. Because he's mostly well known for his concern about racial freedom and ethnic freedom and economic freedom and social freedom and psychological and emotional. But spiritual, he talked about it all the time. All the time. That, that was part of his enduring legacy. You're familiar with some of this? I just wanted to read a little bit of that speech that happened in Washington. It says, let freedom ring. When we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black and white, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. That's God's promise to you, to us. To come and bow a knee at grace, this happens first by going to God and receiving what God, if you look to the world and you look to society, you'll constantly be disappointed and frustrated. We can make growth. Sometimes it's incremental. Sometimes there's big leaps. But this world is filled. It's a fallen world. And so we can't wait for that. We work towards that. But we, we don't have to wait for what God wants to do in our own lives. He'll change us. Christ gives you power to forgive. You don't have to live in a shrinking prison. You can be free. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Well, Lord, right now, Father, I just pray for your hand to be upon us. Lord, I thank you what you're doing here. I know a number of those who are listening have hurts. And honestly, they don't really know how to resolve it. Some of you have been at it for a long time. Some of you don't even want to. It's just part of, it's defined you now. You see your life is permanently scarred and altered. Maybe you don't even long for freedom. Well, that's your beginning stage, my friend, because God wants freedom for you. And so if that's you, then you begin to say, God, I drive to that dream about freedom, about forgiveness, about reconciliation and restoring and, and walking free from my own prison. That's, your, your, that's where you begin.
if you don't even have that desire any longer, somehow that got suffocated. You say, God, I want to give you the strife and the conflict in my relationships, the hurts and the betrayals, the wrongs. I don't want to live that way any longer. If you promise I can be really free, I want to take you up on that. Would you say that? Just right where you're at, just pray this prayer. Say, God, today I want freedom. I receive Christ's forgiveness. Just whisper that or think it. God can read your mind. Say, I want Christ's forgiveness. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Help me, God, to walk out this capacity to forgive others. To unlock that prison. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'm so glad if you prayed with me because that begins a journey for you. I also encourage you to be involved in that freedom small group that will be starting in just two weeks. I'm going to change things up a little bit today, uh, change the end of the service a little differently. And so in order to do this, we are going to close with a song. But before that, I want you to stand, if you would, if you can. If you can't, just you can receive from, you know, where you're at. But Dr. King would often close his services with this statement. And I thought it would be the right way for us on Martin Luther King Jr. weekend to close with this statement. Let this commissioning be upon us. So I'll read it. You listen, but receive it in Jesus' name. Here he sa- here, here's what he would say. Let us go out of here with divine dissatisfaction. Let us be dissatisfied until those that live on the outskirts of hope are brought into the metropolis of daily security. Let us be dissatisfied until slums are cast into the junk heaps of history and every family is living in a decent sanitary home. Let us be dissatisfied until the dark yesterdays of segregated schools will be transformed into the bright tomorrows of quality integrated education. Let us be dissatisfied until integration is not seen as a problem, but as an opportunity to participate in the beauty of diversity. Let us be dissatisfied until men and women will be judged on the basis of the content of their character, not on the basis of the color of their skin. Let us be dissatisfied until every state capital houses a governor who will do justly, who will love mercy, and who will walk humbly with his God. Let us be dissatisfied until from every city hall, justice will roll down like the waters of righteousness and flow like a mighty stream. Let us be dissatisfied until that day when nobody will shout white power, when nobody will shout black power, but everybody will talk about God's power. That's my prayer. That we look to God. He is the author and the finisher. He will resolve things. He meets out justice. He unlocks our prison so we can walk free. And Lord, I thank you for doing that in our lives, beginning us on that journey. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing.